Uh, sorry, I have to put my... A very warm welcome uh, to you all today on this sunny day in Brussels at the occasion of this uh, UAS for Europe high-level event, um, strengthening Europe's innovation for the future. I'm Otto Broom. I'm currently leading the management committee of UAS for Europe, so I'll be guiding you to today through today's program. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us here. Uh, today's event is thankfully hybrid in nature, so we're starting to approach some kind of normality. Um, so we have a limited audience here of uh, UAS for Europe stakeholders, as well as some of our closest EU friends. And um, we also have our online audience who we welcome as well. Um, during the question and answer session, um, the questions from the audience, of course, are very welcome. For the online audience, if you have questions, you will have received also a link to an address where you can send those questions and we'll ask them for you to the panel members. Today, uh, US for Europe will be launching our Innovation Action Plan for Europe um, as input to Commissioner Gabriel's uh, initiative uh, to strengthen European, uh, the Europe's innovation area. This is the result of exchanges with um, Commissioner Gabriel's cabinet, and uh, we were asked to deliver some concrete proposals uh, to, as to how universities of applied sciences can contribute to the European innovation area. Um, subsequently, US for Europe uh, assembled uh, an esteemed group of high-level experts from our member universities of applied sciences, as well as entrepreneurs affiliated to our member institutions, and they've put together this document of reflections and proposals for the Commissioner's uh, benefit. Um, we are today streaming from the permanent representation of the Kingdom of the Netherlands who very kindly agreed to host this event. Uh, we want to thank our Dutch colleagues for your very warm reception and for your excellent collaboration. And without further ado, I cede the floor to His Excellency uh, Ambassador Michael Stibbe, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands to the European Union. I must say I stand here more or less with a sigh of relief. This is one of our first events, uh, let's say post-COVID, where we can actually welcome people back to our permanent representation. And uh, how should I say, uh, what other merely can we, in terms of our interests and the place the Netherlands has within the EU and in the search of the innovation community, what other subject would be one of our first meetings than this uh, gathering and this initiative which you, uh, you have taken and which of course we hope the European Commission will, will take on board and, uh, and bring, uh, bring forward, which is, I think, in all our, uh, in all our interest. And it's also a very good uh, uh, sign, let's say, uh, that we have this possibility of a hybrid uh, meeting this morning. I would like to really welcome, uh, of course, Commissioner Gabriel, the uh, minister from, uh, from Slovenia, uh, Mrs. Kustec, who is uh, participating, and of course, all the guests uh, here and, uh, and online. Um, for us, I think, and in this room, I'm probably stating the obvious, but the fact that we are in these huge, let's say, transitions, the, the, the climate uh, transition, the digital transition, it is obvious uh, that the research uh, community has to play its uh, role, but not only that, 
So it's also obvious that we need to have this combination of research and the translation into uh, innovation. And of course, what institutions are better, uh, let's say, placed to deliver this is, of course, the, uh, the universities of applied science. Uh, we have a long tradition in the Netherlands. We see the results. But of course, uh, from our perspective, being a small country, it does not stop at our borders. We need the bigger, uh, let's say, the, the, the larger scale of what we call the European Union. And in some instances, we even go beyond uh, the European Union. But in any case, it's clear that we need to organize ourselves at least at the European Union level. Um, and of course, the University of Applied Sciences have an important role to play. I can name a few. Uh, we focus on the immediate impact of driven research uh, activities. We are, of course, uh, a partner uh, with SMEs and industries. We speak the same language because we are so, 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 so close to them. And this makes it possible to translate the research results into the concrete applications. Exactly as I said, the value added, if you like, of this, uh, of this type of uh, education. Um, and as such, of course, they uh, provide an invaluable uh, contribution to driving the development uh, in an innovative sense in the, in the regions. Uh, and as I said, the contribution to the big transformations we are all facing uh, is uh, essential. Um, in the Netherlands, of course, we see, uh, let's say, the, the, uh, the impact, but also the possibilities. Uh, and as I said, we also see that we need to increase the participation and collaboration across our borders because otherwise uh, the fragmented, let's say, uh, uh, impact of what we do is what actually then weakens us in sense of, instead of uh, strengthens us. So that is, of course, why this meeting and, of course, the report you have produced from our perspective is so timely. And as I said in the beginning, we really hope that the Commission will take this up uh, uh, in the coming uh, months. Uh, and we look forward to a proposal from the Commission uh, on a, a European innovation uh, area. Uh, and with this, I wish you a very good uh, conference. And once again, welcome and success with your, uh, with your work in the coming months. Thank you. Many thanks, Ambassador uh, Stiebe, for those kind remarks about the importance of universities of applied sciences to ensure that um, research and innovation actors really have an impact both within their regions and across borders. Now I have the pleasure of introducing um, Professor Marjolaine Broussard, who's rector of Artes University of the Arts in the Netherlands, and also co-chair of the University of, Europe, of uh, US for Europe. Let me see if I can start this. It's lovely to be here. Um, yesterday we were kindly invited by the permanent representation of Switzerland and the residency. And I invited everybody to close their eyes. And I think I'm going to repeat the exercise. So could you please all close your eyes for just a minute or two and focus on the fact that this was how COVID felt. On your own, behind your screen, nobody in your direct surroundings. And if you now open your eyes, you see your colleagues, you feel the energy of other people, but you will also sense that we need to re-socialize, as we call it. And this launch event couldn't, ha couldn't have happened at a better time than this. Uh, a large group of experts from all our member institutions worked closely together to get a good handle on how we can contribute to progressing Europe and work with and for the people of Europe. And I think it couldn't have been placed better. So I think it's great that we're here in person, that I can actually see you. Uh, and I'm very proud to present um, the action plan. This is me, we can skip me. We can go to the next slide, please. Yes, it doesn't synchronize, so that's interesting. Um, these are our current members. We only have members of partner institutions, uh, partner organizations, not singular institutions. All in all, it's quite a big group. I'll come to that later. Um, for those who are not familiar with University of Applied Sciences, 
I will exclude everybody here, but maybe there are people in the European Commission that need a little fresh up on what universal applied sciences actually do and how they are positioned. Uh, in the Netherlands, we're at a higher education level, so we're at a similar level as research university or old universities, as sometimes teasingly call them. Um, and we have a slightly different approach. We're more skill-based, more practice-based, um, and we have practice-based research developed over the last 20, 30 years. The universities, of course, have done that for hundreds of years. So they have the tradition, they have the status, rightly so, and they have a rigor, and we need to learn from that. But we need to learn it from our own strength. And our strength is not to copy a research university. Our strength is to be positioned in the region, to work very closely to our social partners, to the people around us, to the SMEs, to the small companies, this is what UASs are and stand for, and this is how we can contribute. And by closely working together with research universities in our own area, it's easy to make connection from science and people without becoming the valorization center for the, for the research university. It's not like the handover a plan. We pick it up and connect it to the people. We need to do this together. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is our mission, um, to strengthen the voice of the U.S. in Europe. I think I've been promoting UAS for the last 30 years and probably will do so until I retire, but I think it's a good course. And I think most of us uh, who are from a university applied science background or university, they always have in every talk you have, every dinner, what is it exactly? And I think by now we have a clear vision and a clear way of stating that. We came together as two networks in UASs and now are one strong voice for innovation and research, practice-based research, that is. So we are a networking platform and we would like to exchange knowledge because collaboration, as the ambassador just said, it's, yes, you have to do it on your own, but the connection is imminent. If we look to the people who study with us now, they have a slightly different focus. So they're more focused on sustainability they're more focused on being social and contributing to the world. They're less focused on economic gain and status. And we as institution have to work with them to take the next step. Creating a platform, creating the opportunity, both for our staff as for our students is key. So reaching out to universities of institutions in Europe is key. We need to find stakeholders beyond our own region, beyond our own borders, and we can only do it if we stick together. So next slide, please. So this is us. Um, we're in over 20 countries representing at the moment. Uh, we re represent more than 2 million students, which is a nice number. Um, we have about 60,000 research staff. And I think this is where we can gain. We can see if we can find finances and the opportunities to create a bit more. So it's over 450 institutes across Europe. That's a huge number, and that's something to be proud of, but also it creates mass, it creates identity as well. So there are, at the moment, nine member associations, as you saw in one of the previous slides. If we go to the next slide, please. So the Innovation Action Plan, as Otto mentioned before, it came together with experts from our organizations who worked very closely together uh, in time of COVID. The idea started a bit earlier. We would have liked to have this launch event a bit earlier, but this works for us now. Um, so I'm very grateful to the, uh, to the experts, but also to Swiss Corps and everybody else who helped to write. We said as a joke this morning, it's a Dutch joke, but I'll translate for you. Uh, at the cradle of a beautiful baby, there are many fathers. So let's all be proud fathers. I think that works. So what are the strengths of the UAS in Europe? Practice-based approach will promote the entrepreneurial mindset of students. Not every student in the US has an entrepreneurial mind. That's a dream. But there is a very big percentage that is really engaged in either to find something new or to create a market and work with it. Transdisciplinarity, I think I haven't met a student yet in my life who said, I don't want to work inter interdisciplinary. How we organize it is slightly different. 
but with the key and big problems around the world in Europe and both in our own regions, I think it's key that we train them from their own strengths to work together with others. And that means you have to open, have an open mind. You have to really try to understand. This is where trans, the transdisciplinary challenges will really help us grow through the wicked problems and through the big issues that are at hand. There has to be, and there always has been, a link between basic research and market applications. Practice-based research is also basic research. It's not something slightly lower. It's not something slightly different. It's basic research, but it has a different focus. Um, and it quite connects to some parts of traditional research, but there has to be a market application. That is what UAS is always doing. They don't think, I'm going to do research and then put it in a drawer or hope that somebody picks it up. It's always in close connection with the market. The regional embeddedness of all the UASs, all the 450 of them, they live in the region. They are really connected to municipality, to the people, to education, to the entrepreneurs, to other institutes. That is how they work. That is how they tick. And because our students do apprenticeships uh, all over, they have a closer connection than traditional universities who don't have those opportunities for students. Next slide, please. I think I have to move a bit quicker. Who is going to key me that I'm going to be quicker? Will you do that? Please. Okay. Uh, what are the challenges we face? The European challenge, I don't need to spell them out, I'm going to be very quick about it. Of course, a new technology wave. Artificial intelligence is key into what we have to do. Creating big data, working with them, visualizing, making them tangible, but also be sure how to manipulate those data, which we see in our daily life all the time. Connecting to the innovation of welfare. Welfare is not just mopping the floor when it's done, it's also creating a healthy life, having that discussion. Creating future dynamic you know, economy, economies, I can't pronounce the word, sorry. Um, it's about new, new economies. It's not being set in the way we are now, but finding new opportunities. Fostering diversity and inclusivity, it's not a woke statement. As one of my students said, you're too woke at the moment. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, but Diversity and in inclusion is what we do anyway. We have students coming to us that are usually the first generation of their family to start at the university. And that is what makes us inclusive. It doesn't mean we do everything right. We need to be more aware of what the differences are, how to respect one another, and how to work with one another without being dominant. Male dominance, white dominance, gender dominance, we need to get past that. We need to respect one another, and we have a role to play in that. And of course, the skills gap. Skills were less valid about 50 years ago, and now we do realize we need higher skills. And what do we do? We provide higher skills. So regional challenges, and just go through them quickly, mitigating tech trends and weaknesses, linking fragment innovation, eco e ecosystems, and promoting Innovation cohesion, I am very terrible in reading things from slides. Um, so promoting open sciences and open innovation and also broadening the participation in European programs. And I think that is one of the key drivers between, behind this network. If we need to be closer to the European Union, to the European Commission, make sure they understand what we do, make sure they understand the value of it and work with them how to put that into play. So it's not just about getting more money. It's how we can contribute to developing Europe. And in this day and age, I think it's important. Next slide, please. So every time I meet somebody from a government, an ambassador or the king, they say, what can we do for you? I think that's a perfect phrase. And every time they tell me that, I think, oh my God, I haven't thought about that. But this time we did. So what could we do? Oh, I just... Make sure there's shorter time frame support instruments. We have no longevity in our research paths yet. We need smaller things to start with. So we need small, not five-year programs, make it two-year programs. Make them a bit shorter. Give us the instruments and give us access to the instruments. 
if you weigh UASs in a science frame, then we're most likely to fail. If you ask a monkey to swim, you will probably drown. So I think we need to get involved into the partnership, into the calls, into those people who actually weigh all the people who respond to the calls, and then make a connection there. So nurture the innovative uh, entrepreneurs of tomorrow. We're closely connected to SMEs, which is the source and the drive of most economies. We focus on the big ones, and of course they're important, they take huge economic space, but the core of development and innovation is in SMEs, is in startups and startups. You have to have loads of them before you can scale up, and we're close to that. So, oh, sorry. Um, to connect to the com complementary strengths of the US, I talked about it, we're next to them, we're next to the universities, but we're also next to the entrepreneurs, and we're also next to the municipalities, we have a role to play in that arena, and we want to do it together. Next slide, please. There we go. <laughs> I have, I have, see, this is what I see. I think I'm not ready yet, but I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Broussard, for that presentation of U.S. for Europe, our strengths and our challenges that we share across Europe, and also our recommendations for how to address those challenges. So now we have the, the great honor and pleasure of uh, hearing from Commissioner Maria Gabriel, the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education, Youth, and Sport. <laughs> Uh, we look forward to your words. Thank you very much for joining us today, Commissioner Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Minister, dear Simona, Your Excellency, dear Professor, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me to start by warmly thanking us for europe for organizing this high-level event. I'm honored to be with you today and I very much welcome your Innovation Action Plan for Europe. That's what exactly we need, concrete recommendations, experienced people with common vision and common ambitions. So from my side, I would like to focus today on three key points as regards universities and innovation. The dawn of the deep tech innovation ecosystem, the role of applied science universities in the new European innovation ecosystem, and our response towards an innovation agenda for Europe. Starting with the new wave of innovation. Until now, we have experienced three waves of innovation, from the first wave related to the first and second industrial revolutions, to the second wave linked to large corporates and research labs, and the latest wave also called digital revolution with digital startups. We are now at the dawn of a new wave of innovation around deep tech innovation ecosystems a new wave that moves from digital to hardware and digital, a new model that promises to radically deepen innovation in every business sector, from manufacturing to agriculture to energy and construction. And this new wave is based on fundamental advances in four main areas, synthetic biology, advanced materials, drones and robotics, and a new set of IT technologies, such as photonics, quantum and artificial intelligence. It's true that we have excellent examples of, in Europe of deep tech startups that are disrupting traditional sectors and we have to be there to support them. And we have the potential to become the world's powerhouse for deep tech startups if we are able to lever on our three competitive advantages. A top scientific base, leading companies in hardware industries and a strong education system. These three elements are indeed the core elements of a well-functioning deep tech innovation ecosystem. And we in Europe, we are leaders in the three of them. And here I see the particularly key role of the universities of applied science, because you have all these different key elements within your experience. Universities should play a new role as facilitators of innovation ecosystems to ensure students can become innovators, creating successful startups. It is not about abandoning their important roles on education and research. It is about complement them with a new role to reflect the reality. 
And the reality is that the majority of the founders of successful startups do come directly from the classrooms of the universities without passing through the research departments. And this change reflects the increased diversity in sources of innovation. In addition to this new role as innovation ecosystem, universities have a critical role to play to provide talent with the right skills. Actually, the latest studies show that the two main success factors for startups in a local innovation ecosystems are the access to the right level of talent and the strength of the education system. And universities are key elements in both factors. And I very much like your concrete recommendations in this direction. The third point I want to tackle today is our joint response. The most important Europe grasps all the opportunities offered by this changing innovation environment. And I like to talk about a new innovation agenda for Europe with a clear action plan. It will be based on a true pan-European innovation ecosystem as the cornerstone of the future innovative Europe. And your proposed action plan presented today will be key for us because we'll, be, we'll carefully analyze it as part of our broad consultation process. And it is of the utmost importance that universities are keystones in the new European innovation ecosystem, especially universities of applied science. And the development of a true European innovation ecosystem poses many challenges. They need to be addressed by joining forces, notably with the universities of applied science. The response will be co-created with you, with industry, unicorns, ecosystem leaders, women venture capitals. It requires that we act differently to how we have dealt with innovation in Europe until now. First of all, we need to take a new approach towards innovation. Instead of continuing the focus on transfer of technology and financial assistance, we need to emphasize the importance of a true European innovation ecosystem as facilitator to foster bottom-up collaboration between business and public entities. In addition, we need to focus on the next generation of innovators and pioneers, startups, investors, accelerators, universities, with a focus on women. Sorry, this topic is very close to my heart. Previously, innovation was confined to huge corporations, research labs, and these days, again, innovation comes from a variety of sources, including entrepreneurs, students, and civil society. And this brings me to the importance of having the center of gravity around the fourth wave of innovation, which focuses on deep tech businesses that contribute to the sustainable development goals. This new approach, new target group, and new wave of innovation calls for a new way of delivering our policy initiatives. We need to move from silos and focus on synergies. The magical world that should become the new normal with Horizon Europe, Erasmus Plus, and all the other European funds working together with the national recovery plans and all other regional programs for innovation. And in this new innovation agenda for Europe, we are putting the universities at the center of our actions. I'm convinced that nowadays, finance follows talent and it's not the other way around like in the past. We need to ensure that we continue having the best talented people and education systems of the world. It is key to ensure that Europe becomes the world's powerhouse for deep tech innovation. In this idea, Innovative and entrepreneurial skills must be mainstreamed in the curricula at the universities and during the professions. It's indeed absolutely crucial to align the competencies needed by the innovators and the ones, the ones taught in the education institutions. The new EIT action, higher education innovation, will open such a possibility for universities. And we very much hope that this new pilot project will provide them with tools to support innovation inside their structure. The first results are quite encouraging because the pilot call has already been launched and will result in selection of 23 pilot projects. They are being implemented over 24 months from July onwards. Additionally, as European Commission, we are currently co-developing with stakeholders and with member states a European strategy for universities. In this exercise, all the missions of universities 
education, research, innovation, and service to society are seen in a unitary and complementary way. The European universities launched under Erasmus Plus in 2019, 2020, I liked very much your concrete recommendation on this, uh, will, will represent an excellent test bed of cooperation between universities and of synergies between education and research. And another essential element, finally, of the universities of the future will be the cooperation amongst the institutions, as well as with the other innovation act ecosystem actors, so that knowledge produced in academia can circulate and be valorized into innovative products and solutions. And that's why, again, you have here an extraordinary experience and we need to continue to work closely together. Well, I would like to conclude now making a call for the European Universities of Applied Science to continue co-creating with us the future European innovation ecosystem. The action plan presented today is a step in the right direction. We need to complement our regulatory measures with the new innovation agenda for Europe to ensure that the innovations of the future happen in Europe. And we are just at the beginning of a passionate joint journey that will move Europe forward to reach our objectives in terms of the twin transition and for an economy that works for all. We should become the leaders of this new wave of innovation that will shape the future of our economies and our societies. And we, together, should not build back better, but we should build forward better. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner Gabriel, for uh, those very kind words, those very inspiring words, which we will take on board. And we will definitely answer your call for continuing this co-creation process. Uh, we've enjoyed this first part of the journey together very much, and we hope to continue it. Thank you very much for your work today. Um, now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Simona Kustic, Dr. Simona Kustic, the Minister of Education, Science, and Sport of the Republic of Slovenia. Um, welcome, uh, Minister Kustic. Thank you very much, dear uh, Chair, dear Vice Chairwoman of the European Universities of the Applied Sciences uh, Network, dear respectful commissioner, dear Maria, dear member of the European Parliament, uh, Mrs. Carvalho, dear ambassador, dear researchers, innovators, dear academics, dear ladies and gentlemen. It is really my great pleasure and also honor to address you today on behalf of the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the European Union and also on my personal behalf because I'm still representing uh, and mainly my heart is representing exactly your community uh, as being a researcher and professor of political sciences. But first of all, allow me first to thank you sincerely, the Universities of Applied Sciences for the Innovation Action Plan for Europe. Universities are the cornerstone of the European research and innovation ecosystem. And those focusing on applied sciences are particularly valuable for translating the knowledge they generate into practical solutions. And also because of the fact that you are the first on the research, on the knowledge base that uh, are addressing, detecting and interpreting the problems uh, that needs to be solved. And uh, today I would like to address you through uh, one very, very important fundamental principle of um, of something that we called uh, the European Innovation Area uh, through three main phases or images of those, uh, this principle. And this principle is called or named synergy. Or something that we've already heard in your first address as do it together approach. A power that connectivity needs to play as a precondition 
for successful innovations. And the task that we as human beings need to do if we want to contribute to successful innovation. And the first image uh, of the synergy, of the successful synergy, is the role of connectivity of knowledge. Connectivity that actually contributes uh, a partnership between education and research between all verticals of educational process and knowledge and research approach. Uh, connectivity through the interdisciplinary approach. That means it is not enough just to be an excellent um, innovator or thinker in the field of sciences, uh, but you need to contribute or, or cooperate also with the uh, social sciences, with the humanities and vice versa. So we are the best if we are doing together and if we are combining all uh, our powers together. And also in this um, relationship, uh, the connectivity between uh, and also understanding and cooperation between basic and applied powers of research of science is very important. So this is the first uh, face, the first image of synergies that uh, I will also uh, speak about uh, more in detail in the, uh, in the beginning. The second one is the synergy uh, that is uh, related to the cooperation, uh, that is related to the partnership approach, uh, the cooperation between all the different stakeholders, all the diff different representatives that are involved into something. Some are involved because of their interests, because of their knowledge. The others, as we politicians, are involved because of the jurisdictions, because of the formal, um, um, formal responsibilities that we need to have uh, in relation to the community. The second part of cooperation is the cooperation between sectors. It is not enough just to work uh, excellently inside one sector, but the sectors needs to interrelate, needs to cooperate, uh, needs to be in partnerships um, between uh, themselves if we want to do the, the, the synergy really the best at the end. And the third element inside this cooperation is the cooperation between various polity levels. That means that from the local through regional, national and European Union, and even far uh, beyond this global uh, level, the cooperation needs to uh, be identified and needs to be active. And the third element of the synergies is the element that is related uh, to the role of connectivity through fundamental research and innovation values. Also, our commissioner uh, was addressing uh, this aspect uh, very much in her speech before, and I'm going to return uh, with a couple of additional thoughts in this, uh, in this regard uh, very soon. We live right now in a world where science is again widely recognized as the pathway to solving the grand challenges, which became very clear during the COVID-19 crisis and also now forthcoming. But uh, at the same time, we have learned that only technological solutions as perfect and effective as they might be at the end of the day do not fulfill their potential if the society does not take them up or understand them or trust in them. And this is why it is so important that the innovation ecosystem brings together all actors and all disciplines, all contexts. For this reason, I do strongly support Commissioner's appeal for the European knowledge area which includes a significant innovation dimension in its content. In this ecosystem, universities are the closest to the citizens, to the local communities, 
small and big industry and sensitive regarding local and regional needs. But no one can be successful alone. As a small country, Slovenia especially understand, understands this very well and appreciates the benefits of cooperation even more. That's why also we work together very closely with our German and Portuguese colleagues in the presidency trio. And together we were able to define our top joint priority, the revitalization of the European research area, which of course includes also the innovation dimension. Innovation is admittedly not in the name, but neither is fundamental science because it goes without saying that there are no barriers between basic and applied research and innovation if you want to do at the end the best possible work finding and result together they complement the complexity of the research and innovation ecosystem and then they are mutually reinforcing and this is why we are working hard in the Council of the European Union right now to set up a comprehensive governance of the European research area as well. And its full implementation on all levels is decisive, European, national, regional, local. And we understand very clearly that we cannot do this without you, without the stakeholders. And as I've said before, we understand the benefits of working together, not only the benefits, but the best possible outcome that we are delivering together at the end of our work, if we do approach like this. We are committed to systematically including stakeholders in the governance and implementation of the new European research area. And I'm also glad that stakeholders appreciate this inclusive approach. Commissioner Gabriel and myself received an open letter of support from the stakeholders just this Monday, and they are ready to engage fully in the governance and implementation of the European research area. And in this spirit, allow me also to invite you, your network, to join this constructive dialogue which is not always easy, it is always and all the time challenging, but I firmly, I, I firmly believe that together we can achieve for sure, not only more, but the best possible at the moment that we are doing uh, our common work. The first opportunity to get further involved in the co-creation of the new European research area uh, will be a stakeholder presidency conference on the ERA to be held physically and virtually on 26th and 27th of October here in Slovenia. And please do uh, receive our warm invitation to participate actively on uh, this occasion and in uh, this stakeholder conference uh, in the end of this month. Your innovation action plan is a rich contribution to setting up a well-functioning European research area. And we are grateful for your 12 recommendations, which are an excellent input into making the European research area more concrete and tangible. They will inform the implementation of many ERA actions that will be co-designed by all in the ERA form. Last but not least, the Slovenian presidency has also set the synergies between education and research as one of its priorities. We have held a joint meeting of directors general for higher education and directors general for research just last week, and we are committed to connecting them and these two areas even more tightly, more closely, also in order to promote better knowledge transfer. I'm also glad that the incoming French presidency has decided to focus on this area and that they will continue our efforts, supported hopefully by a roadmap for synergies that is being prepared. Here too, we are pulling our efforts together for a better result and 
are counting on you as well. A performance-oriented approach, as already exists in the universities of applied sciences, ensures a culture of efficient knowledge and technology transfer and closes the gap between applied research and innovative products. When discussing the role of applied sciences in regional innovation ecosystems, they are certainly strengthening them in terms of knowledge circulation and valorization. Beyond regional cooperation, however, importance of international cooperation in, and in research and innovation also cannot be overstated. We can be better together with the rest of the world. The Council of the European Union under the Slovenian presidency therefore adopted the Council conclusions on the global approach to research and innovation. And I hope they set a strong message, they send a strong message that the Union should promote openness and rules-based multilateralism in its research and innovation cooperation with third countries. A message that I believe you also share. It seems we are both convinced that European strategic autonomy is only possible by vivid and smart international cooperation. This open approach strengthens our innovation capacities and ensures European leadership in key technologies that are based on and reinforce our shared values. And this finally brings me to the already promised value concept and equality in this regard is one of the key European values and also the Slovenian presidency focus, the dedication to put gender equality higher on its political agenda. Of course, we need to promote gender equality because we need to ensure equal opportunities for everyone in research and innovation. But we also need to do this because it will strengthen the European research area. We need to be able to realize the potential of all the excellent researchers and innovators in the EU, male and female together. This is why Slovenian presidency in cooperation with the current and the upcoming presidency trios has produced a Ljubljana declaration on gender equality in research and innovation. And I do warmly invite it all the European Union member states and third countries to endorse it by the end of October. I'm sure that research and innovation stakeholders will play a crucial role in ensuring more gender equality in this field as well. And I would be very pleased if you are um, addressing this important topic um, as well through your work. Allow me now to conclude by reminding all of us that we are stronger together. This is why we need to pool efforts and avoid fragmentation. Together, resilient Europe is our presidency motto. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and really call you to work with the synergies power for our common, better future. I wish you all a very successful and fruitful event. Thank you so much. Is this working? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Minister Kustec, for those very uh, enlightening and very helpful words, uh, also regarding the priorities and plans of the Council Presidency of the Republic of Slovenia. Um, and we will definitely answer your call as well on, on stakeholder involvement in the developing uh, research and innovation agenda of, of Europe. Um, we take on board your messages regarding the importance of cohesion, the importance of uh, taking on making sure everybody's involved, that everybody's capacities and talents are realized in this new innovation area, and that we can only do this together through collaboration across borders and also internationally beyond Europe. So thank you very much for those messages, and thank you for joining us here today.
Um, now we move to a hybrid panel. Uh, so we have uh, two speakers who will be here virtually and two speakers in the room who have joined us here today. Um, so bear with us with the technicalities because there might be some slight uh, sound issues, but we'll try to make it as smooth as possible. Uh, we were hoping that uh, Isidro Balestros uh, of the, um, Commissioner Gabriel's cabinet could join us here today to help moderate. He had to um, replace uh, or substitute for Commissioner Gabriel in a meeting, so he regrets that he couldn't be with us today. So I will be jumping into that seat and moderating this, uh, this panel today. So we're very pleased today to have with us uh, Maria de Graça Carvalho, a member of the European Parliament and uh, a very important uh, person on the European innovation and research agenda in general. She's been leading some of the important regulations um, the Horizon 2020 regulation and the recent EIT regulation and currently is uh, taking the lead from the European Parliament on the subject of the European partnerships. So we're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we also have in the room here today, Director Antoinetta uh, Angelova Kasteva. Thank you for joining us on the stage. Um, so, Director for uh, Innovation, Digital Education, and International Cooperation. So, thank you very much for joining us. And then we also have, um, from uh, industry side, the CEO and CTO of Infineon Austria, Sabina Karlicka. Thank you very much for joining us here today, virtually as well. And finally, from our side, from UAS for Europe side, our Chair of the Governing Board of UAS for Europe, Luciana Vaccaro. Thank you for, for joining us here today. So um, first, uh, we perhaps could do a round of reactions to the inputs by um, Maria Gabriel and the Minister Kustets. Uh, so if I begin with uh, you, Maria Carvalho, if you could uh, say a few minutes in reaction to um, their words and their thoughts on the innovation agenda. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here, uh, to be with you today. Um, and uh, I would like to, to thank uh, Commissioner Gabriel to putting the uh, concept of European innovation agenda in the politic, uh, uh, at the political table for discussion and also Minister Kutek for making this a priority of the uh, of the presidency. Uh, I really uh, like very much the two speeches and uh, um, I, I explain very briefly why. First, the, the nature of innovation. It, it has been very important that we uh, understand it deeply that innovation has changed. And uh, as it was explained both for, by commissioner and by the minister, uh, the, the nature the innovation is no more linear, is a complex, uh, uh, phenomenon is not centralized, is completely decentralized, is not local and regional like in the past we used to, to understand the innovation. Uh, we used to say that uh, science is uh, global and uh, after the application is local or regional, the innovation, but not anymore. And, uh, now we have the innovation as European and even as global, as the minister has said. So there is the need to understand the, the, the nature, the uh, essence of innovation in order to, to, to deal with it and to promote it. The second is the, the concept of ecosystem and the concept of horizontal ecosystem. We should not uh, stay with the, the a bit out fashion idea of the vertical sectorial ecosystems. We know that we are still losing very much in the Commission for the industrial strategy, but we have been pushing that we need to complement that with the, the horizontal uh, innovation ecosystem that has the higher education system, the, the education system, but has much more than that, has all the, the 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 conditions that allow innovation to happen from the, the labor law to the justice system to the uh, 
removing of bureaucratic barriers. So this is what I consider a very important ecosystem. And third, in the center of this ecosystem, of this horizontal ecosystem, acting as catalyzers, we, we have the, the higher education institutions and the um, uh, universe of, of applied science are very well positioned to be the catalyzers of this uh, ecosystem and to do all the links, all the synergies uh, that uh, commish, uh, that Minister Kustek explained very well, the different kind of synergies. As you also know, I've been promoting uh, synergies in my, in my reports and uh, I like it very much, this systematic approach of the minister uh, on the different kind of synergies. And uh, the, the universe of science have a role to play in all different uh, synergies, but the synergies are part, a very important part of this ecosystem. So I was here, uh, music for my ears, all these speeches, because they are really... Uh, with the right definition and what needs to be done for the innovation of the 21st century and not of the last century. So very happy uh, to discuss and to have here the, the two speeches. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Carvalho, for those comments and, and you know, points about synergy where it can be a quite general term, but it's nice to be so precise in the ways that we need to address these these silos in the current uh, situation. Um, now I'd like to, to pass the word to Director Angelova Kasteva. Um, just a preliminary comment on, on the innovation agenda and what uh, and the political inputs from uh, Commissioner Gabriel and uh, Minister Kustek. Yes, uh, good afternoon uh, everyone. I'm really very happy to be here today and it's my great uh, actually participating in a hybrid event when I'm physically present, so many thanks uh, for organizing the event and of course to our Dutch colleagues for uh, hosting it. A very uh, brief reaction indeed, uh, because a lot has been said and I think that uh, we can all agree on uh, the importance uh, and contribution that universities uh, can play to uh, both the um, development of uh, innovation, uh, strategy, innovation area, but also the ongoing work uh, with regards to uh, the strategy universities. A few things that I would like to uh, just uh, uh, speak upon, uh, also sharing uh, the contribution and the work that has been done by the universities uh, uh, for applying science. The first thing is uh, the various voices we have to listen to. Uh, the higher education uh, uh, sector is a diverse and rich sector and each and every voice matter and this is why we are so happy to get the input and contributions uh, for the universities of applied, uh, applied uh, science. Uh, the second thing is uh, the importance to play uh, on the strengths uh, with very concrete uh, inputs and uh, contributions. And we've heard uh, very concrete suggestions of how this can be done. Uh, during the panel discussion, we can fully elaborate uh, on that. Uh, I think that what was uh, already underlined also by uh, Commissioner Gabriel, but uh, also uh, Mrs. Carvalho is the need for uh, interaction and synergies. And this can be seen in various levels. When we talk about education, research, and innovation, and this is what we are doing at policy level by bringing together the European research area, European education area, the European higher education area, and their contribution and relevance to the innovation area, and uh, of course the strategy for universities. What is extremely important, and this is where there is a very concrete input uh, also by the applied science uh, universities, is their link and interaction with other sectors. It is their uh, really impact uh, at regional and local level. It's been said already a lot about their contribution with regards to uh, the knowledge uh, creation and uh, knowledge transfer and how they interact with various stakeholders. A very strong point I would like to make, which was again touched upon by uh, uh, both uh, Minister Kustak and Commissioner Gabriel, uh, this is the importance of education and the importance of uh, really nurturing uh, entrepreneurial mindset and culture. There is still a lot has been done and we can discuss about the existing initiatives, but it is still a lot to be, uh, to be done. And this is of great importance if we would like to 
make sure that uh, we have the necessary uh, talent uh, that we can uh, retain it and actually we can uh, create the necessary products and services that are needed to respond to present, current and future challenges but also to respond to uh, a very concrete uh, expectations. And uh, again, a fiery final point uh, linking to the synergies is uh, hospitalization. Uh, again, uh, how to best use uh, what is uh, existing in terms of uh, concrete uh, programs and uh, instruments, how they can complement them, and we can look during the discussion of what's existing and what we can uh, do uh, about it. I will not elaborate anymore, uh, but uh, yeah. I stop here as I will have probably the possibility to elaborate on some concrete examples <coughs> later on. Thank you. Thank you very much for already for that first input regarding how the, the different agendas are integrated and the importance of integration on the level of education, research, and innovation where I think universities of applied sciences really have, have <coughs> strengths as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, now I move to Sabine Herlichka, uh, CEO of Infineon, so as the leader of one of um, the leading European companies in a very important strategic industry and also um, a very good partner of universities of applied sciences. Um, we look forward to your reactions uh, regarding these political inputs and also the innovation agenda. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, late good morning to everyone. First of all, let me say uh, I very much want to congratulate the Universities of Applied Sciences of putting together the thoughts and in particular the recommendations on the Innovation Action Plan. I think that's very timely and very needed. Uh, why uh, challenges ahead, uh, the twin transition has been mentioned already, which means digital and green. On the other hand, and from my point of view as a representative of a leading microelectronic semiconductor uh, company, uh, also our global environment is changing. Competition in particular in this key enabling technology has become tougher and tougher and nowadays makes it to the news almost every day when you hear about the chip shortage. And our industry is very much driven by knowledge, by technology, by innovation capacity. And uh, based on my view on the issue, science, technology and innovation has become kind of a new currency of this global competition and as much as we should look on at our European capacities and capabilities, I think this kind of global perspective on key, enable, uh, on key enabling technologies, the competition of Europe uh, versus Asia and the US to be a bit uh, uh, blunt uh, is really something of our daily business. And as such, we need to get all the actors together in order to build on our innovation capacity together. And we also need this kind of uh, speed and sense of urgency to get things really done. Because what is innovation? Innovation is not just bright ideas or good products, but really technologies, products, services, put to the market successfully. And therefore, I also very much welcome this focus on the innovation action plan and the focus uh, of the commissioner she puts on innovation as such. The other comment I really want to make is, uh, I, I, I was so glad about the comments and statements by Commissioner Gabriel and Minister Kustic. Commissioner Gabriel visited us uh, three years ago at our groundbreaking ceremony in Austria, in the south of Austria, in Villach, when we started our endeavor to set up, expand our knowledge-driven, high-volume, high-tech manufacturing. 
We opened our new factory uh, two weeks ago and uh, therefore we were also able to uh, provide some kind of insight to Commissioner Gabriel those years ago about our innovation ecosystem in practice. And uh, as such, uh, I feel the conviction and the passion behind her statement and behind Ms. Minister Kustach's uh, statement. And I think that's highly needed. Uh, key elements have been mentioned. Now, the, um, uh, the cooperation, the need for synergies and in a sense of cooperation, I would even say our European instruments have taught us over the last decades this kind of culture of cooperation. This is what we have nurtured over the time. And cooperation is, as I would say, one of the most powerful competitive factors. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, speed, the time for implementation, this kind of sense of urgency is so important and this is also what I have felt. Now coming back to the universities of uh, applied sciences, and I understand some examples can be given later on, but I want to underline that the universities of applied sciences play a crucial role in this entire setting where we find ourselves. On the one hand, through their applied research that has been mentioned, and on the other hand, through the active role in teaching and education. And I would even put it in the sense that uh, universities of applied sciences uh, are not only um, application practice oriented, they, are, they have become very agile organizations that can respond to the requirement of speed. And in many cases, we have been able, uh, in cooperation, to develop attractive educational programs that are, um, I would put it, more purpose-oriented. Uh, they address, of course, important technical or content-related issues, but they also make it very clear that with the particular education, the students uh, not only find highly attractive positions, but they can provide answers to those substantial global challenges that we face every day. So it's really education with a purpose. As much as we as company provide technologies and products with a purpose, in our case on energy efficiency, for instance, and providing answers in response to the climate challenge. Now, this is what I want to underline and stress. Um, I very much appreciate the cooperation with the Universities of Applied Sciences because they provide uh, this application-oriented research capability in cooperation with us, and they are able to respond to those needs of, let's say, purpose-oriented uh, education programs. And therefore, I also very much look forward to further expanding and developing our cooperation. Thank you very much for those um, very useful words as well regarding cooperation and agility, two of the, the strengths of universities of applied sciences, and also this new slogan, which maybe we'll steal from you, education with a purpose. So. Um, thank you very much for those remarks. So now I turn to uh, Dr. Luciana Vercaro, um, who is, of course, chair of UAS for Europe, um, but also vice president of uh, an innovation agency, Unity. And um, in, in this role, uh, what are your remarks on the innovation agenda and the political feedback you've received? Well, thanks a lot for many things that have been said, because um, I think we share the vision, and this is really very, very good news for us. And what I am, what I am very happy about is that uh, um, Commissioner Gabriel uh, really touched some points of UAS um, in sense that, uh, uh, and of the scope of UAS, 
um, she said that startup, success of startups uh, are due to one important factor. So there are two factors. I remember <laughs> I spoke of one, uh, the, um, the environment in which there are very highly de educated people. Um, I would like to make this point. We are a continent, uh, uh, in which we aging continent, and our competitors are, especially in the east part of the world, are have a, a different py pyramid, uh, uh, the demographic pyramid. So um, I also would like to recall what uh, um, uh, Minister Kutuc said, that we need to unite it in this, uh, uh, especially in this moment in which uh, uh, Europe has to rise up uh, after the pandemic. And we have seen also our fragility uh, in terms of the production system. Um, I heard uh, a couple of weeks ago um, this is not really an innovation pro uh, problem, but uh, um, I have tried to refurbish uh, a house that I have in Italy. I was not able to buy some furniture from IKEA. And what is, you know, what is the problem? The screw. There are, the, we have a shortage of screw in Europe because they are produced in China. And IKEA has uh, uh, withdrawn from the market uh, uh, one tenth of their products. Okay, so. I think we can live without a, a sofa bed from IKEA. Uh, but when this comes to semiconductors, this could be very much more critical. Uh, and so in order to uh, decrease our de dependence uh, from um, other sector, then in situation of shortage of production could, of course, think of their own interest. I think we have to reinforce our innovation system and our innovation system altogether. The 27 countries, like Switzerland, I hope. <laughs> um, so the, this is uh, uh, very important to me. Secondly, I would like to say about University of Applied Sciences, uh, it's a comment we always stress the practice oriented, but we should never forget that our students, the aim of our students is also to reflect and to act. And those, the two things go together be because we know that uh, they are able to take decision and to apply the decision they are doing. So I think this is important to stress because this will make of them the innovators and the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Vaccaro, for, for those very uh, interesting words. Uh, we hope you've sorted out the the bad issue that he gave. <laughs> um, so now uh, we move to some more specific questions. We'll be taking actually our first set of questions, further questions from the audience here. So um, uh, that time will come in a, in a short moment. Uh, but first, uh, I just wanted to ask a further question of um, Maria Carvalho um, regarding this next uh, wave of innovation that we see coming. So how do you see the evolution of this new wave of innovation that's coming around deep tech uh, startups in the next five years? And given your role in developing European programs and now the European partnerships, how do you see the role of European programs in this process and promoting European? Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, I see the need to uh, i see the need that uh, we couple much more the, the the fundamental research with the applied research and also the more theoretical with the manufacturing and uh, this uh, line of the force uh, innovation revolution based on deep tech is ex is exactly that uh, a much more link between the fundamental research and applied research and the manufacturing and to regain in Europe the culture of manufacturing in areas, emerging areas. So we don't need only to, in these emerging areas, to do research and to be uh, top on research, but we need at the same time to have the capability to gain the capability to be able to do it, to manufacturing. And 
in quantum computing, in uh, many areas that are emerging areas. We need to be the best research, but also the best in producing materials. We have the enormous uh, uh, ambitions to be leaders on digital. Uh, we can only be leaders in the digital sector if we regain this capacity of being able to manufacturing these the new technologies, the emerging technologies. We cannot be dependent on other parts of the world in terms of hardware. Uh, and this the new hardware, the hardware of the future, we will uh, be able to, to manage, to understand and to produce uh, all uh, these products that come out of these emerging technologies. So this fourth wave of revolution is exactly that, looking in the emerging technologies, deep tech, doing a lot of research, but also at the, at the same time, to be able to manufacturing is exactly what the EIC is trying to promote. And I would join the EIT because the EIT has the component of the skills to, to, to prepare people. And we need to a lot of collaboration between the EIC and the EIT, the EIC that prepares the, 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 tech, the innovations of the future and the entrepreneurs on these emerging technologies but for that you need the talent the talent that is promoted and created by the eit so i think that with the close collaboration between eic and the it that can help this the new wave um, of innovation and uh, at the same time, the collaboration with the partnerships, the public and private partnerships in all the, these uh, important sectors of the future. Uh, we have the instruments, the European instruments, uh, that will, will enable us to push these, these ideas that have been discussing in the first part of the panels. Thank you. that we have the skilled workforce that we need to address this next um, wave of innovation. Um, now I'd like to turn uh, to, once again, Director Angelova Kostova. And your directorate, uh, the Director General, is, is responsible, of course, for the uh, EIT, a long-standing initiative, which really does a lot to break these silos between education, research, and innovation. And also the European Universities Initiative, breaks a lot of geographical silos, as you say. So, Mara, I have an additional question for you is um, how universities could transform themselves into engines of innovation and how the EIT can help in, in this process. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, uh, the importance of developing innovation uh, area um, to the strategy on it was already touched upon by by our commissioner. Uh, I think that uh, it is important once again to underline a few uh, important uh, aspects. Again, the knowledge uh, integration, knowledge triangle integration, where indeed the EIT uh, is already known and it is one of uh, its uh, distinctive features of uh, uh, its model. And, of course, uh, what also Commissioner Gabriel said, uh, the link uh, and integration to the uh, service to uh, society. So, indeed, on our on these uh, proposals, I already mentioned that in preparing the strategy for universities, we are listening to uh, various uh, uh, stakeholders getting their input. Uh, what is important to know is that uh, the universities and the higher uh, education sector during the crisis reacted pretty well compared to schools and other sectors of education. However, the crisis also showed the need uh, to respond to certain challenges. And the transformation process uh, in the higher education sector is already undergoing. So indeed, with the European strategy for universities, what we'll aim at is to support the efforts that are being made by the higher education institutions. And once again, I refer her here to the uh, diversity of, uh, uh, of the landscape, which is uh, 
all kind of higher education uh, institutions. And we would like in particular to uh, look at how to uh, support uh, uh, the effort uh, actually to further foster transnational cooperation between uh, universities. Uh, it was already mentioned the importance of um, um, uh, transdisciplinary uh, 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 cooperation, cross-sectoral mobility and cooperation, involvement and interaction with various sectors. This is something that we would like to further uh, support and work on based on existing practices. And let me refer here to a well-known uh, already initiative. This is the European Universities Alliance initiative, but also uh, the um, uh, excellent centers for, for that. We are going to uh, further uh, actually consolidate uh, this effort. Another important point in this uh, endeavor will be to see how to increase and uh, strengthen the role of uh, universities with regard to regional and local ecosystems, how to further boost the cooperation with various stakeholders. It is extremely important to make sure that the universities bring value to uh, what is the uh, local and regional ecosystem, and this could be done indeed by uh, developing the talent, but also by closely uh, developing the links between the important point that I would like to make, uh, uh, because the list of various actions we would like to implement is indeed long, no need to go through all of, uh, uh, of this uh, individual aspects, but I think what is important is also to develop these innovative pedagogies for universities and also to develop the skills and mindset, it was already mentioned, of uh, uh, young people, of students, teaching staff as well, uh, and uh, to see how best actually to respond to the need for upskilling and reskilling the workforce, taking into account the very specific needs of local and uh, regional level as well. Now referring to DIT, and I'm very grateful to Mrs. Carvalho again uh, for underlining the importance of DIT and its uh, uh, contribution. Uh, indeed, one of the features of DIT which makes it specific is its education plan. And there has been a lot that has been done over the uh, years, a lot of achievement, but for, ex for example, when we were working on the proposal for the new legislative uh, uh, framework for the EIT, what we found out in our analysis uh, through our studies was that uh, the education strand activities have delivered to a certain extent, but there has not been impact at the institutional level. And this was why to actually the uh, new aspects, the novelties of the legislative uh, framework, we have tried to address this issue. Commissioner Gabriel already mentioned the new uh, pilot action, uh, and we are very proud and happy of the high interest of because it is called um, that we see also uh, quite a number of universities for applied sciences who, which will participate in the uh, consortia that will be uh, formed. We will have 23 And just to announce, if you don't know, there will be another call toward to see what DEIT is going to offer. And this will be expertise, this will be coaching, this will be access to its uh, innovation uh, uh, ecosystem, which is the largest in Europe. And of course, uh, of also uh, making a link to the industrial strategy, uh, because uh, uh, we talk about systems and we have to see how to ensure the links, interaction between uh, innovation, but also industrial ecosystems. And here again, DEIT can provide a very good example through the alliances that are led by uh, knowledge innovation communities. They have a very strong, uh, actually, um, aspect strand of education, that they can actually support a very <coughs> concrete education activities for the labor force needed in this uh, particular sector. What is important in such cases is to look and learn from each other, to have this cross-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach. And this is what DIT is also promoting through the um, CrossFit activities it's developing. 
And the very last point uh, uh, I would like to make is again the regional dimension. What is important in all these endeavors, and I think that uh, uh, this was touched upon by uh, Commissioner Gabriel and Minister Kusic, is actually uh, how to, to bring together excellence and inclusivity. We have our um, uh, hubs, uh, centers of excellence across Europe, but we also know that uh, there is still an innovation uh, divide. So how we can uh, bridge all this? And here again, we have the example of what BIT is doing and what they're planning to, to strengthen. This is the regional innovation uh, scheme that it has uh, put in place and it has already achieved very concrete results and we would like to further expand on, uh, on that through the knowledge and innovation communities. Uh, last point, EITIC cooperation, as this is again something uh, which is extremely uh, important and on which uh, uh, we uh, very actively work. There have been very concrete actions implemented uh, uh, earlier this year by um, signing a memorandum of understanding with very concrete actions of cooperation between BIT and EIC. So uh, we see now some first results, but of course we are all looking forward to see in the future even, um, even more. But, and I go there. Thank you, that was, that was really interesting. Uh, I see some of our high level representatives from US for Europe nodding in enthusiastic support of these initiatives. It's really nice to hear all the innovations going on in the EIT to, to meet these challenges. Um, now I turn to uh, um, Sabina Herlichka again, regarding the role of corporates. Um, so we've heard a lot about education initiative, initiatives, public programs. Um, with regard to corporates, what can they do to help promote innovation ecosystems, especially as regards deep tech startups, um, to address you know our common European challenges? Mm. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, uh, the, the co we are a hardware-based company, so <laughs> the cooperation with deep tech hardware startups, for instance, uh, has been and will be an important uh, issue. So we have been implementing uh, our innovation ecosystems in the sense that we have been working together with the education institution, with the research institutions, but also with the startups, uh, with the maker communities, for instance, or the spin-off companies. We do that individually or we do that in the course of networks, in particular on deep tech and hardware startups can use and makers uh, who might set up startup companies in the future uh, can use parts of our uh, hardware knowledge pieces, uh, can develop new applications or develop further steps on the way. So we have set up uh, quite successful innovation ecosystems in the past. Uh, both at our headquarter in Villach as well as uh, at other locations. And we do have uh, quite a number of technologies in our portfolio that have been actively developed uh, together with startups. Um, they, together with us, um, as part of an innovation system, that's the kind of synergies that, that have been mentioned. Startup companies can be much faster than a large corporation can be. On the other hand, a large corporation has the better understanding of markets, market demands, but also how to bring products eventually into the market. So the entire production manufacturing process, getting out to the market, to the customer, and therefore, this is the perfect synergy. And I also want to comment on another aspect that uh, has been mentioned, uh, innovation. At least in our sector, innovation is, has hardly been linear. Innovation uh, is quite complex, at least nowadays. 
and has been complex, interconnected with various actors taking various roles. For instance, because quantum computing uh, is mentioned for good reasons so often, and is one of the um, hot topics. So, for instance, in quantum computing, we are providing a research part for a quantum computer uh, as large corporation based on our research efforts. Now, going back to the startups, uh, because the purpose should also be as soon as startups are being developed and uh, see their potential, I think with the European context, we have to find ways so that they become successful as well. And here also for many years, we have been discussing issues that I think still are necessary to tackle. Uh, for many startups, of course, it's the access to finance. Now finance nowadays is not that big of a problem, even though venture funding and so is still um, uh, to be dealt with uh, and not at the level where we need it in Europe. But then, and I think this is even more important, is the access to markets. And in, in Europe, we have a market that is not as big in terms of registrations and procedures. So this is typically a disadvantage or a major hurdle for startups because in order to access the market in Europe, they have to go through the processes of all the member states. And this, is, uh, this has been mentioned in so many reports, but uh, here we have to uh, find ways to, to tackle that in a pragmatic way. And the other issue that has also a long history, and I want to mention it here as well, even though it's even more complex, is the power, the potential of public procurement, and in particular, the innovation-oriented public procurement. A huge market with uh, the innovation-oriented procurement, uh, public bodies can particularly for SMEs, create a market. Uh, here one can take the example of the US where this has been working for, for decades and working successfully. I know there are tons of studies, but uh, the implementation has to be done at member states level. But nevertheless, this is a huge potential when we talk about startups not only to have them set up and taking the first steps, but also making sure that they can access markets in Europe. And uh, as the commissioner has mentioned, innovations of the future to happen in Europe. So these would be also important elements in addition to this kind of agile innovation ecosystem that uh, all of us uh, have been forming together already in many aspects. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Halichka, for those um, really helpful comments. Yes, we need to break down not just silos, but also some regulatory barriers and borders. Um, now I turn to uh, Dr. Vaccaro for some input more on the university side. So as the rector of a very large and diverse University of Applied Science, um, a useful question would be, how do you think um, university campuses like your own can be turned into innovation ecosystems to facilitate students becoming entrepreneurs and um, setting up their own startups? Uh, I think, first of all, uh, we, have, we, we are in the process of evolving in our pedagogy. As you uh, have pointed out, Dr. Randerov, um, uh, so for instance, uh, in, uh, I can make an example uh, that we have implemented at the University of Applied Sciences for Western Switzerland, in which we were inspired by our colleague from Finland, um, is to evolve a, pro a program, an entire program, into a team academy. So basically, there is no courses anymore. This was quite shocking from 
for some politicians at the time, but uh, this was oriented in a, uh, in, cor in, a, in project. So all the students were involved with the same uh, objective in terms of capacity or competencies to be developed, but every time by a process, by a project. Uh, and these projects were proposed by uh, companies, by public services, um, and the, the idea is learning by doing. Learning by doing with interdisciplinary projects, with uh, uh, projects that sometimes succeed and sometimes fail. Huh? This is also something that students have to learn. Um, and this is also a particularly important cultural program, problem in Switzerland, for instance, that failure is a, is a social um, refrain to try something, uh, to dare, uh, let's say. Um, th so this is one point. We have implemented this first time in 2016 uh, in the economy program, and now we are trying uh, in digital engineering program, and even in healthcare. So this is a complete evolution. I would like to say that not every student has to become an entrepreneur, okay? This is not the aim of our University of Applied Sciences, but I hope that every student can become a professional that can, who can interact with other profession, who can help in developing projects in their company, um, and who is open to the change. Huh? This is something also that is very important in our education. In general, um, uh, uh, Leaders are always facing a, a problem with their employees. Is that why we should change? We have always been doing like this. Huh? This is very human statement. How do we train our students to say, okay, this is time to change? So I think this is one point, pedagogy. Second point is campuses, as you said. Campuses help in uh, breaking silos. This is a particular challenge for my university that is spread over seven cantons. <laughs> so uh, we, our mm, silos breaker is the train, first of all. <laughs> but uh, we foster uh, many projects, interdisciplinary projects um, uh, for the professors that help uh, in developing this uh, um, uh, silos breaking mentality. Finally, uh, we have our own incubators in the campuses. And we facilitated the transition from uh, the education to the uh, to accelerator and incubators we, while they are studying. And sometimes there is even an osmosis between these. So students go back and forth uh, from these accelerators. They go there just to help on a little part of the project. So we help them uh, to develop uh, this agility. Thank you very much um, for that really excellent example um, about the new pedagogy projects and um, these initiatives regarding in, uh, incubators, which I think a lot can inspire a lot of our peers and uh, maybe we should include them in our best practices as well. <laughs> So now um, I turn to the audience. So we have a very esteemed high level representatives from UAS for Europe, where you're welcome to um, uh, intervene and ask a question from our, our panel members up here. So feel free. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Fernand Meijer. I'm the director of the University of Applied Sciences in Amsterdam. Uh, my question is, should we as University of Applied Science not be the champions of the missions which we are now facing in our nations? Maybe a few lines to that, um, because we're talking about deep science and applied science and deep technology and applied technology, and this is all true, but uh, I find that most of the professors and the research we do is really always rooted in the questions which we see outside. It's always rooted in the questions from the society. And I think that the, the strength we have is that we can translate these questions into real proper research, which we do together with industries, we do together with universities, but then we always bring these results back into a society. So I think that mechanism has seen something which is, um, is, is really well developed in our sort of universities. Um, 
And uh, as maybe as an example, which we've been trying to set up is that we have always talked about key enabling technologies, which we understand very well, which is deep tech or whatever. But we also need to have key enabling methodologies, which are the, the methodologies which we need to have people adopt technology and start to understand how they can actually change their lifestyle, for instance, to adopt new ways of uh, going about with energy, or <coughs> new lifestyles to keep healthy and so forth. So my question is, could you maybe reflect on this idea that we should be the champions of the missions? Is your question addressed in preference to any of the... The full, the full panel. The full panel. <laughs> I want four answers. Well, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll limit it to two answers. <laughs> And then so some others can have an option. So I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but uh, Director <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I made a reference to that, to the different missions. And uh, indeed, DIT, as I already said, has the three education, research, innovation. But what is also important, and this is what is going to be added to the transformation agenda of universities, uh, is actually the service to society, and this is where the role of uh, universities of uh, applied uh, sciences uh, uh, has, and they can further elaborate and further show the strength that they can play into that. I think that this is extremely important when we talk about how to address the pressing challenges we have today, we have into the future, we all, re all know about uh, the challenges re related to climate scale, digitization, the aging, the demography, uh, demographical uh, change. So any new technologies, any new products and services have to see how they can serve actually citizens, how they can serve society. And this is how you can uh, uh, come into play with your strength, with your contribution. So highly important. I stop here. I can only echo what you've already said. And it will be interesting to hear from you what else needs to be done in order to make it even uh, stronger and visible as a contribution from the side of universities, applied, uh, universities applied sciences. Thank you very much for that and also for, for emphasizing that fourth mission of universities and universities of applied sciences, which is service to society, which we have our stakeholders, of course, really integrate into their core missions. Um, I'd like to pass the word to the Sabina Herlichka. I saw you nodding very much about this mission point. So, uh, I feel like you have a, a pressing point to make. <laughs> no, a full, uh, full in, in full agreement. And I'm uh, myself waiting impatiently uh, for the first activities of uh, missions to start, just to be very specific. Take the example of the 100 CO2 neutral cities. There is an urgency, there is a lot of competence. And uh, I would very much encourage the universities of applied sciences uh, to, to, to start preparations already. Uh, and I'm pretty sure these are the perfect examples where our knowledge, our joint knowledge, is urgently needed and can be implemented fast. I'd, I'd actually like a third input, um, if possible, from Maria Carvalho as well, given your overview of all the European programs and you've seen the evolution over the past years, perhaps not leading right now on the missions file, you have so many other things, but well, what do you think of this role of universities of applied sciences in the missions, given our, our very close to the citizens uh, position? Yes, uh, I, I think that uh, the um, universities of applied sciences have a, a very important role on missions. Uh, because, as it was very well explained, they, they learn from the society, they do back to the university, they do the research, and, the, and they give back their, what they have found out, what they have studied, what they have researched to, this, to the society. So they are very close to the society. And there is a, an extra point. The missions, uh, in, from my point of view, is a, a, a quite a bottom-up process. Uh, it starts not very well defined, so um, it's up to the stakeholders to, to define it in, in more uh, details what the missions will be. So uh, due to the, the implementation of the 
applied science universities uh, in the territory in Europe uh, that to so many institutions throughout Europe, they will be uh, the ideal partners to, to, to shape up, to help to shape up the missions, because really, in my opinion, the missions need to, to be shaped up. Uh, it's still uh, a bit of a fuzzy concept, I have to admit. The European Parliament uh, doesn't have a role to play in the shape up of missions. The missions were defined in Horizon. It had a role to play when the Horizon Europe was uh, uh, um, the regulation was developed and approved. But after, it's up to the Commission with the stakeholders uh, uh, to, to shape the, the missions. So we don't have a role like we have in the partnerships or in the EIT that we need to, uh, there is a co-decision uh, between the, the proposed by the, the, the Commission, but uh, after there is a, a co-decision between the Council and the Parliament to approve in, in all the details with the missions is not like this. So there is no regulation that we have to approve. So it's now in the hands of the stakeholders to shape it. It's really a co-creation, uh, very bottom-up. So it's ideal for the, the, the universities, the higher education institutions, to help to shape up in a very uh, concrete and uh, uh, useful uh, um, instruments, uh, because they they we are at a crucial moment, or they are just a bit uh, more networks to to have dialogue, or they are really uh, very useful, concrete for research, for applied research, and to involve all the, the society. And it depends on the capacity of the stakeholders to grasp it and to transform it in really important instruments. A vital message. We'll pass it on to our member universities of applied sciences that will grasp the, the missions and ensure that they have some impact. Um, I'll turn to the audience for our second question. Uh, Winfried Lieber from Offenburg University. I'm uh, quite uh, pleased to hear and uh, to see that it's well understood uh, that uh, uh, the European innovation system uh, can substantially benefit from the crucial role uh, of uh, our uh, kind of university, uh, especially as a key player in regional innovation system. But after all is uh, uh, said and, and done, or to put it in a nutshell, the question to me is, uh, what are the, the right, the, the, the specific funding instruments uh, of enabling U.S. Uh, to uh, better scale up their regional uh, strengths to create European innovation? So, uh, what, uh, for me, there's uh, uh, it is necessary. It's necessary. It is uh, really necessary uh, to come up with with fresh money. Uh, to to strengthen already existing networks as as well as to establish uh, new uh, networks. So be beyond uh, federalism and uh, beyond uh, federal state restriction. For me, this is the scope of European Union. So for, uh, sorry, for me, it's uh, we are running a little bit out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we are aware of the strengths of our university. It is well understood. But what, what are the next uh, steps, really, in, in terms of uh, is there some money left within the EIT? There is, a, there is a money within EIT and, 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 and for, for the kicks. But it is also uh, well understood that uh, our universities, they have a really limited access to this money. Yeah, maybe uh, I can address this <laughs> hot potato to the representative of the European Commission, because it, it is just for the background. I mean, it was one of the, the founding principles of US for Europe that, you know, we tried to see how we can engage better with the European programs. And um, yeah, so any suggestions you have or initiatives you, you can mention would yeah. be welcome for you. I would like also to comment afterwards. Yes, please. After. Of course, I can limit to whether the responsibilities of my DG and my responsibilities are. But indeed, the EIT is a very good example because of the many things I've already said and the integration that it uh, provides. Uh, 
indeed uh, the knowledge and innovation communities is uh, one of uh, the instruments and this is where the education activities are channeled. I already said that this uh, new uh, higher education initiative, which is a pilot project, is a new opportunity. It starts now, but uh, for the time being it's a pilot for three years. We hope it will be successful, but uh, any continuation uh, in the future will very much depend on the results of the pilot. But uh, certainly uh, designing this action, seeing this evolution, uh, will happen in the next year, uh, next years, and as I said, uh, there will be a second call. So any of your institutions, if uh, interested, uh, can can uh, apply. So this is something that should be considered uh, as an opportunity. The second thing that uh, should be considered is the European Universities Alliances. And uh, again, you know, this is uh, under the Erasmus. Uh, it's interesting to hear, by the way, by the stakeholders and the universities, because on our side, we're making the effort uh, to also um, in, in introduce the links between these various uh, uh, initiatives to see how they can better complement each other. We, for example, see that some of the universities, and I speak here more broadly, that participate in the European Universities Alliances also participate in the new higher education initiative. What is their experience? What is missing? How this could be further uh, actually um, upgraded and developed in the future? The regional innovation communities, because the higher education initiative, the new action, is one specific action, but this doesn't mean that uh, your universities cannot participate in the knowledge and innovation communities. Uh, that are uh, actually operating um, within the EIT community across Europe in a very yeah, regional, local um, environment. These are two very concrete uh, uh, examples from our side, but I'm sure that there will be others as you can also apply to uh, activities that are implemented and will be implemented on the, the other parts of Horizon Europe as well. Can I intervene? Yeah, for that uh, answer, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely keep digging at opportunities within the European programs. Um, another question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So could I pass the word to Maria Carvalho on yes. how universities? Yes. I want to. <laughs> I want to have a comment on that. Uh, so. Um, it was explained very well the, the the opportunities in terms of the EIT and there is many opportunities in Horizon Europe, EIC, the partnerships, the collaborative, the pillar one. But I want to draw the attention that the bulk of the EU budget at this the next few years is in the hands of the member states through the recovery and resilience plan and the regional funds. We have promote synergies of all these programs with the regional and the recovery and resilience plan to allow that uh, the member states replicate programs like the, these ones. Why not to have a kind of VIC or a kind of VIT using recovery and resilience plan? Europe will not have a problem of lack of funding in the next few years. The problem that we will have is how to apply well these funds. These funds, the recovery and resilience plan is debt is going to be paid after 27 by the younger generations. They will be paid back. So the most that we can do is to uh, invest this money in areas that are important for the future of this generation, such education, research, innovation. But if we are not vigilant and if the, the, the universities and higher inst education institutes are not vigilant, they will not be applied from the lessons we have learned in the in the past, they will not be applied in this kind of program. They will be applied in more constructions, another uh, runaway, another bridge that is not probably so so important and has a, a negative impact in the environment. So please make sure that the recovery and resilience plan is well applied and replicate some of these programs that are so important for our universities for our industry for our competitiveness and creates the skill force of the future key point about also looking at especially now given the resilience uh, plan looking at the national level on how we can have an impact
Um, there was a question in the middle of the audience. Yeah, thank you. I'm Jurit Snyder, president of the Breda University of Applied Sciences. I, it's a bit of a, a follow-up uh, question. And our, our president said, rightf rightfully said, uh, that our students should reflect and then act. And we saw a lot of reflection on our uh, white paper today, which was very welcome. And my question is, what should our action, what should our act be with this advice to bring this further? And also to bring, uh, not that we uh, put words and then into action. So what's, what should the advice of the panel be to bring our advice further on the, on the tables? Um, yeah, maybe uh, I can address this to um, Maria Carvalho, first of all, just to change the order. <laughs> um, so how, how can we take our proposals and, and move them forward in the next steps on the discussions around European innovation? Um, the one very interesting feature of the European innovation area is that the discussions uh, that Maria Gabriela promote are really bottom up. She has, for example, asked us uh, with our networks that we come up with ideas and, uh, for example, I, I share one of the um, um, one network with uh, research institutes and uh, industrial associations that is the knowledge for innovation and we have done meetings and open meetings to to gather um, proposals and we have uh, present to Maria Gabriel uh, uh, an innovation uh, manifesto so this this uh, uh, is really a, a bottom up uh, 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 exercise uh, that will be very important for the future to define what is this new concept of innovation and very not only to define in theory, theoretical terms but how we are going to implement it for the good of our competitiveness we really need to make sure that our industries and our sectors and our enterprises uh, are competitive at the global level and we are losing competitiveness in many areas we are not at the forefront in digital and digital is going to be the the big uh, subject uh, is now already is already now but it will be in the future and we are behind the us and china in this area we need to regain that so we we really uh, must do everything that we can with the universities, with the researchers, with the entrepreneurs to make sure that we regain this competitiveness. And this is a very interesting exercise uh, that through networks that uh, are quite open, uh, that you can send us the, uh, your ideas, you can participate in our meetings and we feed into uh, this information or directly to the to the to DGRTD, DGAAC, or the cabinet of the commissioner, because this is really uh, Commissioner Gabriel has asked for inputs for the, uh, the, the concept of innovation area. Thank you very much for, for the, those invitations to the various forums where we can contribute. Um, I'd address the pretty much the same question to uh, Director Angelovica Silva. Also just on, yeah, what, what can we take as next steps uh, to, to try to yeah, work with the Commission on, on implementing our proposals or having a, a greater impact within the innovation area? Yeah, uh, indeed, I think Mrs. Carvalho has already said, <laughs> said it all, so <laughs> I mean, I can only agree with what uh, she, uh, uh, she said and she su suggested. We are in this uh, period of uh, indeed collecting uh, views of uh, various stakeholders and reflecting and analyzing. You would imagine that in many of the inputs and reactions and contributions we receive, there is certainly uh, common uh, issues, challenges, proposals. Uh, and of course, uh, these are very important and, uh, and seriously taken on the side of the Commission in making the analysis and developing uh, its uh, uh, proposal. And certainly, uh, we have to see where different angles and how they can be best uh, uh, integrated in a, in a proposal. Certainly, this is a process that will continue once we have uh, 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 the, 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 the agenda, the uh, 
European Innovation Area, that will be also, it will be important to, to implement it. I think that it was Minister Kustic who referred to the governance and also the call of stakeholders to, to have a say, input, uh, and participate in the governance of the European Research Area. But looking more broadly uh, into these aspects, uh, there is uh, indeed uh, important uh, um, there are opportunities and important input from various stakeholders. Similarly, when we talk about the European education area, this is how we integrate the input from various stakeholders. So I think that today it is very timely, the input is very relevant, it will be very uh, uh, closely analyzed, taken into account, and certainly this conversation, this dialogue, this cooperation uh, will continue. Thank you very much for, uh, for those comments. Um, before I hand the word to um, Dr. Vaccaro for closing remarks, I just wondered if uh, Sabina Herlichka, you had some final thoughts um, for, for this event today, for the innovation agenda and the very interesting comments we've had from the panel today. Mm. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the last question, of course, I understand the background, but as let's say, reflected practitioner myself, uh, I would also like to encourage everyone and the, the, those 450 members of the UAS to go ahead with implementation yourself. I mean, you put the finger on the right points, get together and continue to implement what you do and as such creating the examples that are so important at European level and getting involved in Horizon Europe, in the EIT, in all the instruments we have um, and doing that together. So yeah, I'm hands-on and you are uh, alike and therefore uh, I think all together we have to continue and we are proactive and push it forward ourselves. And on the other hand, I also want to mention, because it, this has not been tackled today, innovation, uh, education, um, as I mentioned, education with a purpose, but also building on technology. And uh, so many times we have uh, told ourselves the story of the lack of technical skills. This is, in the meantime, has become also an urgency. And here I very much want to encourage everyone together also with us as companies, big and small, uh, to forcefully come up and further implement um, uh, programs, educational programs on technology, and in particular using digital to convey this enthusiasm for technology and very much doing that also together with joint programs. We have started implementing programs like this in Austria, but I think there is such a huge potential and there is a huge need in particular for uh, the technology sector that is lacking massively in technology-oriented skills. And here, the digital approaches, and I'm not just talking about streaming events, but really digital formats of education and, and teaching, this can be really a game changer to conveying the enthusiasm for technology and as such providing this kind of education with a purpose. Thank you so much. Education with a purpose will remain with us. <laughs> so now I pass the word to uh, Dr. Vaccaro for some final closing comments uh, on behalf of US for Europe. Oh, yes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Brun. Thank you to the audience and thank you particularly to our panelists and uh, um, uh, Commissioner Gabriel and Mr. Kustic. Uh, we had, I think we have all a lot of pleasure being here. I think that everybody says that, nevertheless it's true, <laughs> that uh, um, this is a sign that life starts again uh, and we see that also our action starts again. We start to see the future. I am particularly pleased by the fact that, that uh, um, all our um, 
speakers from the Commission at different level uh, tells us US for youth, uh, US for youth, talk to us. So I think this is the main takeaway message. We need to uh, to speak and to speak out and to show how we can contribute to the system. Because in the end, uh, I think that our common purpose as a citizen of uh, uh, the European Union is to contribute to the prosperity of our uh, people. Um, secondly, I would like to say there was one question, what is the next step? Uh, I think we should not forget that our member states sit uh, in the um, uh, European Council, uh, and so they should be informed by ourselves. So we are a national, uh, we represent a national organization. I hope that uh, uh, each of our president has from time to time in interaction with the minister cabinet, we should inform them about our action, about our papers. Uh, and so we should reinforce also our presence at the national level. Uh, so that they bring, can bring our voice um, uh, uh, at the level of, of the European discussion. Uh, finally, I would like to say that there is a lot of dynamism. I, 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 I like the numbers, so I was impressed by the numbers uh, that Professor Rostap showed this morning. How many million students we have? Six million? Two. Two. I, I, I love so much that I multiply. These are two million citizens. Two million citizens who uh, will be educated, will be trained. Um, we will have a, an education with purpose. Huh? Uh, and so we will contribute to the Europe of tomorrow. Uh, we are the Europe of today, but I think we should think about them as the future generation who will build um, our uh, um, union of prosperity and peace. And I think this is... Uh, our common aim. So thank you my, very much for being here and for your words and contribution. Thank you so much.